For the last little bit, I have been reading through in my devotions the book of First Chronicles, and I've really enjoyed it, and I would encourage you to as well. Now, it's a bit tough to get through some of the, uh, the beginning portions and the later portions because it's chapters and chapters of people's names, and who is the son of who and the son of who, and I'm sure they're important to the history of Israel. I know they are, um, but as I'm reading through it, there's been some key passages in there that have stood out, some important stories. And we're going to look at one of those this morning. And I was struck as I read this passage by how quickly somebody's wrong perception and wrong assumption turned into a raging war between multiple nations because of assumptions that were made. And this story is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 19. I've titled this message, How to Avoid a War. In the Bible, it's on a national level. We're going to look on a personal level because these principles are exactly the same on our own lives as they are for an entire nation. Now, before we get into the story, I'm going to recount three specific people that are involved in this story because we need to know who they are so we don't get confused by their names as we go through it. The first one should be easy for all of us. David, king of Israel. You got that? David's number one. <laughs> we know him. The second man in the story is a man named Nahash, the king of Ammon. And in this story, he's dead. He's just died. And just some background to Nahash, we don't know who he is, really. I tried to study it out to figure it out. Because there is a Nahash in the book of 1 Samuel, who was the king of Ammon, who came to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said, surrender, and I will gouge out all of your right eyes. He's not a very friendly guy, um, and we don't know if he's the same man. It's possible, but if he was, he, he was at the very beginning of King Saul's reign as the king of Israel, and he reigned into some of David's reign, so he would have reigned in the 40s or 50s of years, so it's possible that he was that man. But anyways, others think that he was a relation to David or someone who helped King David during his time when David was fleeing from Saul, but that's all aside. All we know from this story is whoever he was, he was a friend and an ally of King David, this king of Ammon, Nahash. So remember him, Nahash. Man number three that's important in this story is a man named Hanan. Hanan is Nahash's son who just took over the kingdom of Ammon. And that's when we come into this story. There's some key events here. So as I said, Nahash died. In the story, David sent servants to Nahash's son, Hanan. Because, again, David and Nahash were friends. And David sent a message of sympathy because the guy just lost his father. And he sent this kind message. Now, as the servants arrived with this message, Hanan's advisors said, You know, King Hanan, we don't think that they are up to what they say they are. We think they're spies. Hanan jumped on that conclusion right away and humiliated David's servants, as we'll read. And that turned into a war. And the war went downhill very quickly, or, or got bigger and bigger very quickly. We'll see that as we go through. But those are the key events, just to give you some background on it. We can learn lessons, again, to this, from this story that apply to our own lives and relational situations that we might be facing, because we probably all have somebody that we have some difficulty with. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's somebody else outside of our family, but whoever it is, this story gives us some keys that we're going to look at. I've heard somebody term a phrase as to the events that we're reading in this passage. They call it something, they call it a crazy cycle. Somebody makes a wrong assumption or gets upset. Somebody else takes that the wrong way and they do something back and somebody does something back and back and back and back. And you end up in this spiraling downward uh, of events that ruin a relationship. So let's go through the story. I have four lessons for us to learn today. And number one, lesson number one, we're going to get from 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verses one through four. This is assume the best. Our lesson to learn from this is assume the best. Let's read the verses out of the, the ESV translation today. 1 Chronicles 19, verse 1. Now after this, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, died, and his son reigned in his place. And David said, I will deal kindly with Hanan, the son of Nahash, 
for his father dealt kindly with me. So David sent messengers to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites, to Hanan, to console him. But the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanan, Do you think, because David has sent comfort to you, that he is honoring your father? Have not his servants come to you to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved them and cut off their garments in the middle at their hips and sent them away. Do you think that would make David happy or upset? I'm not sure that they were very good advisors that King Hanan had. And his advisors made assumptions. It's obvious from this passage that the servants of David who had came had already stated their purpose. They had already come saying why they were there. They were there to bring King David's message of, of consolation to Hanan. Because the advisors said, do you think he sent comforters that he is honoring your father? So the servants have already said why we're there. But the advisors did not believe them. They assumed wrongly. Because it says in verse 2, David said, I will deal kindly with this man. I will send a message. That was the purpose. But assumptions were made. So don't jump to conclusions. Part of assuming the best about somebody is to not be critical or to give ears to rumors about that person, unless it's verified truth. Even then, sometimes it's best not to dwell on it or to think about it. If Hanan had stepped back in this situation from what his advisors were telling him, if he had stepped back from the men who were speaking into his life at that point and realized that David had been an ally of his father, a friend of his father, if he had just stopped to think for a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, this guy got along with my dad. Why would all of a sudden he be coming to overtake my land? Why? If he had just asked that question, he may not have jumped to the conclusion that David was spying on him. Now, what could Hanan and his advisors have done differently in this story? That is a question I ask my boys all the time in the middle or after a conflict. What could you have done differently? What could you have said differently? How could you have said it differently? Are things that I, we go through in our family. Well, they didn't have to show them things that would have been valuable information as spies. They came, they were with the king, they were with the advisors. The king and the advisors could have arranged for them to go to a spot where there was no information that they would have gotten. They could have given them a nice meal. They could have written a message and given them some gifts to send back to King David, and they could have escorted them back on their way to give them safety as they journeyed to Israel. They could have done all of that without them getting any spy information, and they would have been back out of the land of Ammon. No problem. They could have handled it very differently, still not being sure if they were spies or not, but just waiting to see what happened. But instead, what did they do? Well, they shaved, their, shaved them. It doesn't say exactly how they shaved them. It could have been their beards. It could have been their head. Um, either way, the beard in Israel was a sign of maturity. If you got your beard shaved, it would have been humbling or embarrassing. The story actually tells us later the men were very embarrassed, and David said, wait in Jericho until your beards have come back. So that was a big deal to them. Now, if they shaved their head, that was against Israelite law. They were not allowed to shave their heads. In the book of Leviticus, it says that. So either of these were very demeaning things to do to them. And it says they cut off their robes at the hips. The King James puts it a little more explicitly. It says they cut off their garments in the midst, hard by their buttocks. Now you imagine these guys are wearing robes. They cut their robes right at the waist. So they've got nothing on below. Now, they're in the foreign land of Ammon. They've got nobody who's going to give them clothes. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is to these men? I mean, imagine that. Imagine, don't imagine yourself in that. But that is an awful thing to do to somebody. Say, okay, go back to your king now. They were almost looking for a war by assuming that these men were spies. Something else I thought of in this is in, Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 10. He said, don't forsake your father's friend. Proverbs 27, verse 10, as a prayer phrase. 
Solomon was David's son. I wonder if Solomon had heard this story from his father. I have to think that David had recounted this story to his, you know, his kids who were growing up and to others in his kingdom. And if Solomon had maybe this story in mind when he wrote that, don't forsake your father's friend. Don't go against him. Because what happened to Hanan when he forsook his dad's friend? It cost him, we're going to see, two ally nations and thousands and thousands upon lives were lost because of one thing. He forsook his father's friend, mistook him for an enemy. So the application for our life, avoid assumptions, period. Avoid them. It's dangerous to dwell on assumptions when, you know, we as humans, we do that really well. We assume things really well. And once we assume, we, of course, must be right because it's the only thing that makes sense. Well, look, it must be right. But is it true? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, in the love chapter, says, Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. See, love believes and love hopes. Love assumes the best. It is not love to assume the worst against somebody else based on an assumption. So unless there is undeniable evidence, love will believe the best. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, another passage for our application for this. Philippians 4, 8, we're not going to read it, but it's what we know as the eight gates of the mind, the things that say we are to think about these things. What is number one? Whatever is true, not whatever you assume. It says whatever is true. Think about these things. If it's verified truth, okay. Sometimes, again, if it's really negative, it's still not best to think about it. But if it's an assumption, put it out of your mind. It's not worth dwelling on. Avoid it. Because you can turn friends into enemies pretty quick if you dwell on assumptions about them. If you hear something about them, you can lose your relationship. You know, all will be revealed in time. If Hannon had just stepped back, done as we had said, sent them on their way with a nice message and a blessing, he would have found out in time whether David was his friend or his enemy. He could have just observed rather than doing what he did. But Hannon's actions led to a war that I imagine afterwards they wished they hadn't started. Because we're going to see the first thing Hannon did when he realized that David was upset with him was he tried to get reinforcements. He already knew he was losing that war with David. I don't know why he thought to start it, because he knew he had the lower hand in that deal. David had a strong army. And, uh, but anyways, it started a war that I'm sure they regretted. It's much better to think the best about somebody else than to assume things and to start relational wars based on assumptions. All right, so lesson one. What did we learn? Avoid assumptions. Avoid assumptions. Lesson number two that we learn in the next couple of verses of this, be humble enough to apologize. Be humble enough to apologize. First Chronicles 19, 5 through 6. And they departed, so these are the servants who are departing from Hanan. When David was told concerning the men, he sent messengers to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, remain at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, Hanan and the Ammonites sent 1,000 talents of silver to hire chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Aram Maka, and from Zoba. I want to read that again, verse 6. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, Hanan and the Ammonites sent. Pause. This is the pivotal point of the repercussions of this story. Imagine how the story would have been different if it said, Hanan and the Ammonites sent messengers to apologize. Hanan and the Ammonites sent gifts. But instead it says, Hanan and the Ammonites sent for reinforcements for war. So our lesson for this is be humble enough to apologize. If you realize you started a war in a relationship by something you've said or something you've done, 
be humble enough to apologize. Because guess what? If you go get reinforcements, you're going to have a battle. And it's probably a battle you don't want the repercussions from. Because again, these were friends. His father was a friend and an ally of King David. So when you are in a conflict, and I am in a conflict, we've got two basic choices. Humble ourselves and apologize, which is costly, or send reinforcements to do battle. And sometimes these reinforcements are thoughts. You know, when we've had a conflict, I'm sure you have been there as well as I. When you have had a, a, a mis disagreement or you're assuming something about somebody, what is it easy to do? You think about it up here. You think about maybe what you'd say to them, how you'd correct them, how you'd fix it, even if it's an assumption that you don't know for sure is right. That can be like building reinforcements in your own mind. You're building your weaponry <laughs> against what you would say. Sometimes those reinforcements are things you might do to get even with the other person that you're assuming about. Sometimes it's also other people that you tell your story to. You tell your side of the story. You share what, what you think, and you share the assumption. I won't ask for a show of hands on how many of us have shared an assumption about somebody else that maybe was shared with us, but it's not a true thing. It's just an assumption. But we can build reinforcements by building a group of people who hear that side of the story. We're only going to start a war, and it's costly. There are some simple words that we should say. If the war has already been started, if the things have already started, like they were here with Hannon and David. Now, if we just step back and this hadn't happened, if Hannon had not um, done what he did to humiliate David's servants, he wouldn't really have to do anything because David wouldn't know that Hannon was wondering if he could trust David. But he'd already taken a step too far. He'd already cause the beginnings of a war. And so if that has happened, there's some words that can fix it. They are, I was wrong and I'm sorry. I was wrong and I'm sorry. How many of you like saying those words? Is there one? Good, I'm not weird. I remember my parents telling me when things would happen in relational conflicts with my brothers going up, and they'd be like, you need to say you're sorry and make that right. And I hated that. And guess what? I still do. It's hard to say sorry. You know why? It makes you look bad. You made a mistake. It's hard on our pride. That's what it costs. Maybe... The assumption was right. What if you were right in your assumption? But what if your attitude was wrong? What if you told other people about it and got them involved when they didn't need to be? What if, what if, what if? See, it's almost guaranteed in any sort of a conflict in a relationship that you're wrong. It's guaranteed they're wrong too. <laughs> in some way, it may not be wrong about the information, it may be wrong about the attitude or, or how it was handled. Um, there could be so many different ways. I remember Pastor Tucker saying uh, at least a couple times from this pulpit or he was sharing in Bible school maybe when he was teaching us, he said, you know, I pastored for a long time and I've had a lot of people come to me for counseling in their marriage. And I, he said, I can only remember two specific times throughout the years that somebody came to me and said, I am having a conflict in my marriage. What can I do? To make it right. They would more than often say, I have a conflict. This is the problem with them. This is what they're doing wrong. If they would simply change this, we wouldn't have this problem in our marriage. That's the easy human perspective. We see the faults in other people. My boys' instinct, and I probably all of us, especially when we're younger, is to point out the fault that the other guy has and not our own. Again, there are some simple but costly words. I was wrong, and you can add whatever, I was wrong for this or I was wrong for that, and I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me and mean it? That would have averted a war. How do we know that? I'm, I, can, I can assume that. 
because King David had done this before. Or maybe he did it later, probably later actually in the story of his life and his reign. But when Nabal was really unkind to David's servants, David was going to go and deal with him. And Nabal's wife came out and said, please forgive us. He doesn't know what he's doing. And what did David do? He showed wisdom. He said, thank you for coming. I will let it go. I believe that David would have done the same thing here if Hanan had sent messengers and said, we were so wrong to treat your servants this way. Please forgive us. And it would have been over and done with. Instead, a great battle happened. So both options are costly. The sorry option hurts our pride, and it doesn't feel good now. Sometimes it feels better to do the other options, where we, we build uh, an armory against whatever the situation is. And it might feel better at the moment, but that is expensive down the road. It can hurt a lot of people. So that's lesson number two. Be humble enough to apologize. Lesson number three. Don't hire or be a third party to fight a conflict. Let's talk through it. What happened in this story? Don't hire or be a third party to fight a conflict. Verses 6 and 7 of 1 Chronicles 19. We already read verse 6. We'll read it again. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David... Hanan and the Ammonites sent 1,000 talents of silver to hire chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Aramaca, and from Zobah. I don't know how much that was, but it had to be a lot of money for the supply of, of soldiers and stuff that he got. Verse 7, they hired 32,000 chariots. Now, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll see that is a huge number of chariots for an army to have. They hired 32,000 chariots. And the king of Maka with his army, who came and encamped before Mediba, and the Ammonites were mustered from their city and came to battle. Now, the ones he hired, it doesn't tell us right here, but eventually it tells us they're, they're in a group of people we would refer to as the Syrians. So he hired the Syrians to come help them, and he gathered his own Ammonite army to help them. But he hired a third party to get involved with his conflict. Well, let's talk about how that applies to us. Jesus dealt with this in Matthew chapter 18. We're not going to read the verses, but verses 15 through 17. He says, if you have a problem with somebody, if you think something happened with somebody, what is the first thing that you do? You go directly to them. He said, don't go hiring third parties and getting other people involved. You try to work that out yourself. And there, if there's hope for resolution, if there's not, then he goes through steps of what to do. But the first thing is go directly. And you have to approach humbly, not with anger, not with accusations, but seeking a restoration. That was Jesus' point, like restoring a relationship. Go and work it out. So again, if you hire the infantry and you hire the cavalry and you hire the enemy to back up your side of the story, it's only going to be a war. Because it says David heard what he was doing and he prepared his army. He knew Hanan was, uh, was getting an army together. And so David was like, well, I got to go deal with this now. And he went and he dealt with it. What do you do if you're the third party? What do you do if somebody has come to you with their conflict? You haven't been involved with it. You don't know anything about the story up until this point. You haven't assumed anything. But one of these two parties who has an issue come to you. What do you do? Well, you try to bring a resolution to it. Try to be the voice of wisdom without getting involved in the war, without picking sides. If this is inside of a family, that can be really tough to maintain a neutral ground, but it's pertinent. Proverbs 26, verse 17 says, Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. That's not a nice picture. You could grab my dog by the ears and I don't think you'd do anything. But the picture that is trying to point out here is this dog is going to be angry. So if you jump into this situation and you take a side, people are going to get upset. And we're going to see that that happened as we look at point four in a little bit. It's like grabbing a dog by the ears. When I was a kid, six years old, I didn't grab a dog by the ears. I tried to quiet him down by patting his, his hind end. And he turned around and bit me twice on the arm and broke my bone. 
broke my arm. He bit that hard. I was a little six-year-old kid, still have the scars. You know, that dog was not happy that I was getting involved. I was telling him to be quiet. He was a stray dog. We were watching him trying to find the owner, and it didn't turn out good. It may not turn out very well if you get involved in somebody else's conflict and you're not there to help, but you're there to take a side. Be there to help. That's the point we can learn. There's a, uh, somebody that Sarah and I really admire um, in, up in Canada. They, they run a ministry. They've got a number of grown children now. Their children, they have a great relationship. They're all very involved in their, in their parents' ministry and stuff. And so we were talking to the dad one time. And he was just sharing some advice, some wisdom with us. And he said, I have different people come to me and, and, and present an issue. They present a problem to me that they're having with somebody else. And he said, I always handle it like this. I am so sorry with what happened to you. It does not sound, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound like you were treated right. But you know what? The person that did that is not here for me to talk to right now, but you are. And he will start with them and work through with them how to fix things. He would try to bring a resolution to it. He wouldn't take their side in the story. He would help them through it. That's what we have to do in being a third party. So our lesson we learn here, if you hire a third party, you get them involved in your conflict. They're not there to help the situation. They're there to take your side. It's going to be a battle. Don't hire or be a third party. Number four, our last one for today. This is the rest of the chapter. Look for ways to de-escalate. Look for ways to de-escalate. We're going to read a bunch of verses for this because it tells us what happened in the rest of the story. And then we'll talk through them a little bit. First Chronicles 19, 8 through 9, or 8 through 19. First Chronicles 19, 8 through 19. When David heard it, he sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. So again, David heard there's a war coming. I better get ready. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the city, and the kings who had come were by themselves in the open country. When Joab saw that the battle was set against him, both in front and in the rear, he chose some of the best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Assyrians, or the Syrians, sorry. The rest of his men he put in charge of Abishai, his brother, and they were arrayed against the Ammonites. So the Israel army split up. They're fighting one half against the, the Ammonites, one half against the Syrians. And he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will help you. Be strong and let us use our strength for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. That's an amazing attitude to go in with. This Joab didn't have anything to do with it. He's the commander of the army. So he's like, it's in God's hands. We'll, we'll do what we need to do. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near before the Syrians for battle, and they fled before him. So remember, the Syrians are the hired ones. They're the third party. So they engaged them first. The Syrians fled. When the Ammonites saw that the Syrians fled, they likewise fled before Abishai, Joab's brother, and entered the city, their own city, and Joab went home to Jerusalem. Verse 16. But when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, now remember the Syrians are not involved in the conflict except they've been hired. These are the third party. They saw that they'd been defeated. They sent messengers and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the Euphrates with Shopak, the commander of the army of Hadadezer, at their head. And when it was told to David, he gathered all Israel together and crossed the Jordan and came to them and drew up his forces against them. And when David set the battle in array against the Syrians, they fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed off of the Assyrians the men of 7,000 chariots and 40,000 foot soldiers and put to death also Shopak, the commander of their army. And when the servants of Hadadezer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and became subject to him. So the Syrians were not willing to save the Ammonites, anymore. Of course. But our point from this is try to de-escalate. What did the Syrians do? Now they're involved in a conflict that wasn't theirs and they were on the losing side. What did they do? They got reinforcements and said, we're going at it again. Let's battle this one out. And they made peace with the one who had been their enemy 
They made peace with David because they lost. But it basically says at the end there, they'd have nothing to do with the Ammonites anymore. The Ammonites had been their friend. They had been the ally. They had been the one who were hired to come fight with them. And now they're like, no way are we going to go help them anymore. Now let's take this and put it in, in a, a relationship setting. You have a problem with somebody else or they have a problem with you. A third party gets involved and now does more battle, more damage, builds more reinforcements. It's not a good ending, is it? See, it wasn't de-escalated. It was reinforced to do more battle. So the lesson that we can learn here from these guys is, is not to go through a whole war to have peace, right? De-escalate beforehand. And our application is Romans 12. The verses I have are verses 17 through 19 for our lives. Romans 12 17 through 19 it says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. We've preached on these verses before through Romans 12. Verse 18, if possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. If we would live by these verses, we would avoid conflict. We would de-escalate because it says do everything you can to live at peace. Now, it doesn't mean to, to lower God's standards. That's not at all what we're saying. That's not within what we can do because God tells us how we're supposed to live. That's outside of the realm of possibility of what we can do. But it says don't pay people evil for evil. If somebody does something against you, don't go do battle against them. Let it go. Give thought to do what is honorable and live peaceably as much as it depends on you, on your half of this equation, live peaceably. If you've got somebody who's openly coming against you and starting conflict, you do what you can to de-escalate it and to back up out of it. I tell my boys pretty often, you don't have to be right. That's true for all of us. You don't have to be right. People are more important than things is something else that I tell them all the time because somehow kids have a love of things. <laughs> Some grown-ups do too. People should always be more important than stuff. But one of those things is the need to be right. People are more important than the need to be right. There'll be some discussion going on in the back of our van while we're driving or in their room while they're playing. And I'll walk in and be like, boys, people are more important than things. You don't need to be right. And see something else that we say to them is you can be 100% right and 100% wrong at the same time. You can be completely right with your information, with your points of view. I have one who's basically always right with that. You can assume who he is. But you can be totally wrong in your attitude. You can be totally wrong in your treatment of somebody else while you are 100% right in your information. So you don't have to be right. Sometimes it's wise to let things go. So in this story, the third party lost in every way. The third party got involved with a situation. They brought reinforcements into the situation. They ended up having to make peace with their enemy and they lost their friend in this situation because they were trying to win a war, they weren't trying to bring a resolution. So the four lessons that we learn from this story. Number one, assume the best or avoid assumptions. Number two, be humble enough to apologize. Number three, go directly to resolve a conflict. Don't hire a third party. And number four, do everything you can to de-escalate it. Bring it back down to a level of good standing. See, if David and Hannon had practiced these principles, they probably would have been friends and allies like David and Nahash, Hannon's father, had been. And if you practice these principles, you will keep your friends 
And you young ones out here, these principles even work for you. They even work for school situations you're going through, problems you've got with other people at school. Practice these four things. And they will help. Assume the best, be humble enough to apologize, go directly to resolve the problem, and try to bring it back down. So that is the lesson that we learn from this story in the book of First Chronicles. As I said, there's a lot of interesting things that happen in the book of First Chronicles, things that we can apply to our lives and learn from. So my encouragement today, besides living this way, is go home and read your Bible. And that's what I have. So God bless you.